start recording now. All right. So I'm going to stand like right, right here for a second to say hi to the viewers out there in, in Zoom land. Um, and <laughs> I know. <laughs> so one camera is not working in the room. Apologies. So welcome to our first brown bag of the year and uh, to our in person and virtual brown bag. I'm so very excited. And our first guests of the year in our room. I'm so very excited. Um, we, we have Tom Vo and Jen from SCAG, which is the Southern California Association of Governments. And they're going to talk about, I feel like I need to come back over here. They're going to discuss with us um, and share along with us some of our student interns, the internship program that we have had running with SCAG for a year and a half now about. Uh, so every semester student interns work uh, within the regional planning department with Tom and John, who have graciously uh, mentored our students along in the internship as well. So I will turn it over and you can go ahead and uh, discuss any more information about SCAG and yourselves. Well, you know, since the, the camera is facing this way, so I just wanted to say hi to <laughs> and say hi to the uh, audience online. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to um, come and present at your first round back series at USC. And as Laura mentioned, um, you know, we've been uh, in this partnership with you uh, uh, for a year and a half now, and everything has been great so far. Um, thank you for the support. <laughs> and don't, don't, don't jinx anything. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan, you know, for, for giving us this opportunity and thank you for training your students so well that we don't have to really do anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we only give them tasks and they just do it. So, um, so you know, without further ado, you know, I, I'd like to introduce my colleague here, Jung, uh, to introduce yourself and maybe um, Sophie and Will, you can introduce yourself. So thank you. I can just sit here and introduce myself. Hi, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Jung So. Uh, I'm in uh, uh, modeling and forecasting department at SCAD. I work on a lot of data and GIS stuff and then also GIS programming. Uh, it's been, I joined this guy in 2011, so it's been about more than 10 years, already more than 10 years. I think that both of us can. I'm really glad to be here. I'm also a USA alumni, class of 2006. I went uh, to USA uh, for my master's degree in planning. Uh, so, yeah, always proud of Trojan family. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Will. I am. A senior geodesign student here, and I interned with SCAG for my fall 2020 and spring 2021 semester. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a senior, and I'm a double major in business and geodesign. And um, I uh, interned at the same time as Will, so we were kind of working on this this project together. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, and then you know later on. Um, uh, in the later portion of this presentation, Will and Sophie will be giving you a demo. Um, and they will talk about what they did with us through a story map that they developed. So, which is very creative and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you'll be impressed because we were very impressed with that. So, um, so without uh, further ado, let's, let's get started. Um, so this is just an overview for today's presentation. Uh, we'll give you um, a little bit of background of SCAG, what, uh, what we are, what we produce, and what kind of data projects we're working on. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into the uh, internship program, talk about you know, when we started and how many projects we completed. And then finally, um, last but not least, you know, go to um, Sophie and Will. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the regional land use data development uh, through the lens of story map. And then um, if if we have time, I would also like to cover um, some of our ongoing um, technological transformation projects that we work in a SCAG called the SCAG Regional Data Platform and how um, it will transform the way in which um, local jurisdictions use technology for their local planning activities. And this particular project was presented by Jack Benjamin. He came to SCAG um, in September. 
uh, and he presented uh, about this project and the power of GIS to our regional council members. Uh, we have about um, 80 plus um, elected officials who sit on SCAG's board who basically make the decisions. Um, and so he presented to them to show, show them the power of GIS, what we can do with GIS and the project that we are working on um, to help with their, to help, uh, their cities. And then um, also part of that is the local data exchange. So we'll, we'll talk about that too. All right, so, um, so I will uh, give you a brief background of um, SCAG. So what is SCAG? SCAG stands for um, Southern California Association of Governments. We are the nation's largest metropolitan planning organization in, um, in, in the country, uh, which consists of about 15 sub-regions. We have 38,000 square miles uh, in terms of the land size, and it's between the states of India um, we have 19 million residents. I think with the recent census, I think we are about uh, 20 million um, residents now, about 48% of the state's population. Um, and then it's comparable to the state of New York uh, population. So there's a total of 197 local jurisdictions in the SCAC region, 191 cities, in, in, uh, in incorporated cities and six counties. Um, as you can see there on the map, on the right, uh, highlighted in blue there, um, that's, uh, those are pretty much the six counties that we are um, serving um, in the region. And they are from the top, you know, you see Ventura, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Imperial. Um, San Diego is on, they have their own uh, jurisdiction. So they are on the, they, they have their own, um, you know, MPO, state, uh, and county, and so on. So they're not part of this. And uh, in terms of um, the uh, economic, uh, economically speaking, we are ranked about 15th largest, you know, we are the 15th largest economy in the world. And you can imagine why we have a lot of, port, we have major ports here, airports, amusement parks like Disneyland, Hollywood, a Universal Studio, Raspberry Farms, and so on, and, and, and so many uh, money generators here in, in, in Southern California. And on the right hand side, we just kind of use our um, data, the geospatial data that we have been collecting for the last 10 years or so, to give you a brief pie chart of our land use breakdown here. And as you can see, uh, we have roughly about you know 8% of our land total uh are residential and then one percent is commercial and, and so on so that just kind of give you a glimpse of the data that we have scanned and john can talk more uh, about it yeah. and so, so let me just briefly go over this program uh, scan psc or psc scan uh, internship uh, special science institute internship program so we just saw uh, a map and a chart and also Tom also explained about that we have 197 local jurisdiction, and there are about over 5 million parcels. And we developed the land use information for all those 5 million parcel information. So SCAG uh, is maintaining uh, that kind of regional uh, geospatial data. So through this kind of program, SCAG is this is a part of the uh, University of Partnership Program. So SCAG is partnering with the uh, USC, SSI, uh, to uh, this kind of great internship program. So like I mentioned, uh, SCAG is maintaining uh, quite a lot of regional land use, geospatial land use database. And then we thought this program could be a great opportunity for SCAG and also USC students, like a win-win strategy. So, uh, through this program, you know, we started uh, we initiated this uh, program uh, early in 2020 before the pandemic happened. So, so that's why we actually this is first time we met our interns in person. So, so yeah. So we uh, since uh, spring uh, 2020 spring semester we uh, have have had this uh, internship program, and then uh, through this program uh, we. 
So from uh, student and this USA perspective, this is we thought this is great opportunity for students to learn about and also work on the real world task. So we sketched that uh, we provided a training and also we provided technical guidance so that they can be equipped with the skills and knowledge for our project. And also on sketch side, we have a lot of great projects, but a lot of times we need the high level you know, resources. And of course, in USC SSI students uh, have a lot of great geospatial skills and knowledge. So it was a really great opportunity for sketch staff also to, uh, to get some technical support from this high level skilled uh, student. So on one hand, we provided training, but on the other hand, uh, uh, students also provided great uh, technical support for uh, various SCAX projects and their programs. So uh, starting the summer 2020 and still ongoing, we had uh, 11 internships and also total eight projects. So that's basically a brief uh, introduction of this program. Thank you, John. And um, I think one thing to also notice too is that not only that we are, uh, you know, that we get help from the students, but we also learn from them as well because of their um, you know, recent knowledge about the technology and the industry and you know, all the, all the basic, basically all the knowledge that you guys teach them and we also learn from them as well. And one of the forms, you know, that one of the technology that they use is story map to present, I mean, we're still using PowerPoint, you know, to do presentations, but they took it up a notch to do story map and present. So I think I thought that was really great. And um, and you know, we kind of exposed that to our internal staff staff. So like, hey guys, you can really do this. And people got excited and you know, um, through, through the process. And um, so sorry, I I to, I forgot to mention that, um, just going back to SCAC and what we do, I forgot to mention that two of the major projects that we produce at SCAC is, uh, the first one is the Connect SoCal, uh, which is the Regional Transportation Plan uh, Sustainable Community Strategy. This is basically a long range plan. Uh, we're looking at about 25 years in, uh, in advance in the future, uh, looking at the way we use transportation and the ways we use land use. Um, to make sure that you know these two components are used in the most efficient way that will help us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to promote uh, housing affordability, to promote air quality, uh, good movement, safety, and so on. So that is one project that we, we work on, and we basically have to update this, update that project every four years. So um, the previous adopted Next SoCal was uh, 20, 2020. So we adopted uh, our last Connect SoCal in 2020. So right now, uh, Jung and I, we are preparing, uh, basically the whole department, we are preparing for the next uh, 2024 plan. So part of that, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's directly related to the work that we are doing, which is the regional, uh, uh, land use data that you guys have to work on. So that is the preliminary data set that we have to prepare. Uh, we look at different different types of land use information uh, at the parcel level. So, you know, John mentioned that we have 5.1 plus million parcels in the region. Each of those parcels, we have data included in them. We have attribute data. And each parcel, we have information like um, existing land use. So what is currently, uh, what was that land being used right now? How is that land going to be used in the future? So that's called the uh, general plan. Land. We also have zoning. We also have specific plan and, and all times, a lot of great information in there. So what are we going to use that data for? For that data we use to forecast the future. So, so for example, if this particular land use will be used for residential in the future, then we can estimate the number of people who will be living there. Or if, if that particular parcel will be utilized for commercial, then we can estimate the number of jobs in the future. 
So that information, when once we have that information, we call it the forecasting data. Once we have that data, we integrate it into our transportation demand model because each person, each job, each job will generate a certain number of trips, certain number of uh, vehicle travel. Um, so based on that, we calculate the number of trips generated by each household or each business uh, commercial centers. And based on that, we can calculate the number of uh, the greenhouse gas emission. Um, so that's how we kind of uh, understand the current and the future plan. And so based on that, we can come up with some plan that will meet in the middle will help us to improve our air quality. Um, did I miss anything? Oh. <laughs> so yeah, so so that, that is the Connect SoCal and we're working on that. Uh, the second one is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, also known as the RENA, um, which is recently also completed that. And Regional Housing Needs Assessment is pretty much, um, um, in simple term, is house uh, planning for housing. And um, we have 196, 97 um, jurisdictions in the region. And each local jurisdiction shall develop a certain number of units to accommodate future growth to accommodate future population growth. And this one is particularly focusing on uh, different you know, housing income category. So higher income category, lower income category. So um, as you know, housing affordability is, is one of the hardest you know, topics right now. And as you know, um, based on the recent recall of Governor Newsom, now he's back into office for these just pushed out two bills, right? SB9, SB10. So that's gonna be a huge thing for, um, for the housing market. But I, I won't get too much into that. But basically the regional housing use assessment is to look at the existing condition and plan for the future um, to accommodate future uh, population growth and housing use. All right, so uh, with, the, with that, um, you know, now I would like to introduce um, Sophie and Will to talk about their uh, project that they worked on, they worked with us. And uh, let me just connect to this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what we were in charge of with our internship was the part of the general plan update. So Will and I both worked on um, a city and updated the land use information for each of the cities. We made the story map. So yeah, this year we started out with a little bit of uh, context about SCAG, um, a lot of the same stuff that uh, Tom and John just told us about, but I guess we can get a little bit more of an insight into the into the actual data sets that we're working with. Um, here's just all 197 jurisdictions in the SCAG region and their outlines. So we can see that there's <laughs> a lot of cities and jurisdictions that need a similar process to what uh, Sophie and I did for for two places we did at Beaumont, California, and Fullerton, California, and uh, Riverside and Orange County. And then just some challenges that we encountered with our internship. So um, first of all, uh, we hadn't really had much like coding experience, even though we'd done a lot in ArcGIS beforehand. So Will and I both had to um, just familiarize ourselves with ArcPy and Python scripting, which um, Jung and Tom helped us a lot with. And then um, debugging errors. So like as you're learning, like as you're new to um, 
doing the scripting, like there's just frequent errors that you have to sort out and um, kind of troubleshoot. But it's really rewarding to um, kind of like get to the bottom of them and like have your code like finally work. And then um, also the the data sets were just really large. So um, eventually we just clipped them down to our specific cities. And then, um, yeah, just going through general plan documents because um, yes, like general plan documents vary a lot from city to city. So getting the information you need from different ones. Yeah, just I'm, like John said, there's in the total data sets, there's around like five, 5.1 million parcels. So. I mean, previous like ArcGIS labs that we had done in class, we would have like 40 parcels or something. <laughs> so it's definitely a scale increase that required some adaptation and interesting new workarounds, especially when dealing with code also and trying to sort through these errors because we can't check all 5 million or even <laughs> at the county level or city level, it ends up being in the hundreds of thousands. So. It, it was really useful, like taking on this new workflow to deal with this really large scale of data. Yeah, and then uh, we just have these like sliders in our um, story map. So this is Will's, um, he started off with this um, parcel for, or this data for the um, Riverside County and then um, flipped it to a mile or a half mile buffer around um, Beaumont, which was the city that he was working with. And then um, mine, I was working with Orange County in the city of Fullerton. So here's the like original Orange County data set. And then we clipped it to the um, buffer. I'm sure the SSI computers that we were using were very thankful for the Yeah, the stuff. So yeah, I guess now this is like our our process of actually doing the data development. Our goal was to get this new data from the general plan PDFs that aren't necessarily spatial or even in an Excel form and kind of finding a way to input them into the into the spatial data so that Sky can use them for their various projects or for their data portal. So the first step was adding the new fields that we needed to account for. So um, various like APN codes, which were used to just join and make sure that we're pairing the right data to the right um, parcels and updating the attributes from the 2016 data to make sure that we keep the old data as we, as we put the new data in so nothing gets lost. Yeah, and this shows our parcel layers with the spatial join um, point centroids that we made to conduct the spatial join. So that's going on. And and right here we just have um, like a segment of my of my code um, for the initial part of the project. So um, right here we were basically. Um, disaggregating the, the county level to city level feature classes because we we're only working with um, the, the particular city, even though we had the whole county of data. Um, and so, yeah, we don't really have to get all the way into it, but you had to create a domain just for like which values were, were acceptable for the land use. And then um, just find feature classes. Oh, this is kind of interesting. On the side here, um, there's like the different um, small cities that were included in the layer buffer around Fullerton. So it kind of like makes an outline of the city. And kind of a less technical benefit to this internship was like the interpretation of the codes between the SCAG and like the individual cities or counties. Um, sometimes it wouldn't line up correctly. So you would have to do a little bit of interpretation of would this zoning code kind of be equivalent to this? And I think that was really helpful for just understanding these 
large PDFs, which are sometimes really, really daunting and kind of unreadable. Um, and breaking it down and being able to work with it in GIS is something that, that's definitely been very useful and a big learning moment. Mm -hmm. um, and this part's part of the last Yeah, this, I guess this section is turning what we see in the PDF, which I guess you can see here, this kind of large block of text and um, putting it into what we call the correspondence table to join the data to our uh, spatial parcels and boundaries. And like I said, making sure that we understand what each code means and what its equivalent for the SCAG codes might be just to make sure that everything is neat and orderly and kind of matches up. And then this code will make it so that it gets joined and update um, the things that change for the, uh, for the year. So a lot of the old data was from around 2016. So this was now the 2019 data for each uh, general plan. And the general plans varied a lot. Like, I think Will got a little bit unlucky with his. This is like. <laughs> yeah, Beaumont decided to make a lot of changes between 2016 and 2019. <laughs> yeah, my plan was very short. I got off easy with the reading the general plan. Sorry, Will. <laughs> um, yeah. These are just like small images of the updates, but if we get into it in the next step, which was. The final step of updating the symbology, which is kind of where you get to see like all the progress and then um, converting it back from city to county level level feature classes so that um, like further work can be done on it. And um, a big part of this too was trying to create a code that like other interns could could use in the in the future that could serve as like a template because um, once once you like figure out the base, like the template code, it can really be applied to whichever city with like small changes. So um, that was kind of the point of re-aggregating it to the county level. Um, and then this is where you get to see the different land use in each of our cities. So here's Fullerton. Um, this was the land use map that um, I made on ArcGIS and then we just changed the symbology to match up with um, what it looked like on the general plan. So this is mine. This is the general plans. Like pretty cool to see. <laughs> and then here's Will's. Is and then is the general plan one the PDF file? Mm -hmm. scan. Yeah. Yeah. So the. The one on the left is, I guess, like the more updated plan. So I guess for for Beaumont, they kind of you can see there's a little bit of like a, a kind of downtown Main Street district thing that kind of got it added. Um, so seeing the process of how that worked at the parcel level is, is kind of interesting. That that area was a lot smaller and less kind of designated before. So yeah, was, I guess in all those, both a very technical thing with a lot of the ArcPy learning that has definitely stretched on to other classes and internships that I've done since, but also being able to work with the planning in a general code, general plan uh, documents hands-on and seeing what's actually happening and how it gets implemented and how it gets represented. Yeah, and also just like the power of coding because our projects that we've done in um, previous classes have just been on a very smaller scale and the, the methods that we used in those classes like would not, they would have taken a very long time for this project and, and coding it was like exponentially faster. So it's just really cool to learn about that. Thank, thank you again to Tom and John for all your help and like bearing with us and 
it, it was a it was a great internship as well. Yeah, it was a great experience. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Can I ask Sophie and Will a question? Oh yeah. So is the recommendation that all of our class exercises have 40,000? <laughs> <laughs> I can make that happen. <laughs> I would say it was just, I mean, when we were dealing with the very, very large data sets, it was, it was definitely, a, there was an element of frustration because like okay. we would, we would input the, the code and it would either, it would just kind of freeze up and you couldn't tell if it was still working or if it was uh, like had frozen or something. And, um, I guess learning to adapt to these these big data sets was, I guess, one of the, the big takeaways because for SCAG, they have to deal with 5 million data sets for every problem they do. So there's and nothing then, to work around. And then the second question is, since you know one of my bosses is sitting next to me, should we, should we <laughs> cancel convocation you know, when everybody comes to school for the first time and just have a one week Python immersion class for all Donna site. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think both. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, I'm I'm currently in a class where Python's a big part of it. I think it's called it's like urban informatics and the planning school. Oh, with Bo? Yeah, and it's it's interesting because we're starting in that class learning Python kind of from the ground up again. But even though I've done Python and Arc by through this, it's still useful to look at it again. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's no real downside to like working with Python, especially when there's a, a project at hand mm -hmm. in the urban informatics class or in the static internship. Yeah. And in answer to your first question, just to go off of what Will said, I would say I definitely appreciated keeping the data set small while I was learning it because trial and error with um, the really huge data sets um, is like basically impossible considering the processing times. Yeah. I think that's what Will and I struggled with at first because yeah. we were just getting it wrong <laughs> every time, but it would take like 10 minutes to process. So. But, but maybe so. compromise 38,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so, would you have any advice for future interns about how they could be uh, well prepared to be able to do the kind of projects that SCAG is giving us the opportunity to have you participated? I honestly felt really prepared um, with my prior information. And even though we were learning a lot of new stuff, like um, I know Joan, like he was really great at answering all my questions. like really promptly. So the learning process was honestly pretty smooth. I would just say like to make sure to stay on top of it if you intern because I was tempted to shy away from the initial parts of the project because it was uncomfortable to um, do a lot of work in, in coding that I'd never done before. But obviously like the, the sooner you put in more work, like the sooner it gets comfortable and then it becomes really rewarding. Yeah, I would, I would say building off that, it, there's kind of a thought that for many students, since internships can kind of be really competitive a lot of the times, that when you show up to the internship, you already have to be the best, like, perfect candidate, and it's kind of embarrassing to ask questions or ask for help, whereas a lot of the learning is done when you say, like, I don't get how this works, I need help, and um like tom said it's it's a two-way learning street like both parties have something to learn from each other so i guess not being afraid to ask questions or admit that like you don't know a certain aspect because a lot of the times you don't because it's, it's a completely new experience that said there are great online resources for um self-studying this kind of thing like a lot of the time we were just googling it and using like esri resources it was great yeah and, and with the i guess remote format of it um 
taking the time to meet and talk through these things because code can kind of be very independent, but talking through it for me at least helps me just think about what I'm doing and sometimes just explaining my question, I'll like answer my own question by just asking it. Um, so your experience with the internship is all remote, right? How did you manage the time? I, when I did two semesters of it, so the first semester I was doing it as the, like the SSI internship class. So I tried to like think about it as a class in my head, kind of, I'm the style of worker where I like to have kind of like, I guess a shift or like a designated time to work on it every week. So I, I kind of tried to keep a very regular schedule about it so that I wouldn't kind of, I guess, like do one thing and then get distracted. And I guess opening up the remote desktop and everything was enough of a process where if I started doing it, I was like, I got to work on this for at least a big amount of time. So I get my, my time's worth out of it. There's also in our format, we had a weekly meeting, so you can kind of like structure your work around that. And I know Will and I would at least try to get it done like a couple of days before so that we could ask John or Tom if we had any questions and then like have a productive meeting from there. The meetings are really helpful. How many hours did you spend working every, every week? It's, it's hard to say because <laughs> I guess since there is no like kind of clock in and clock out, but I, I would say it vary based on what, um, I guess Jung had prepared like kind of a, a sample outline of certain mini tasks to get done to like complete the whole code. So some weeks definitely would take longer and required more extra meeting times with them or extra times when we had to talk about it. So kind of, yeah. kind of variable. <laughs> it definitely averaged out to around eight to 10 hours a week. Also. In the beginning, um, a lot of it was getting acquainted with like the different technologies we were using. So um, it was kind of like up to you whether you wanted to like do a lot of like instructional videos or like online courses or not. Um, in the beginning, it was more flexible and then it started ramping up definitely. And towards the end, we were <laughs> really um, grinding on that, but it was good. Talk to John has some final next steps. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it was really great to have you both helping us out. So it's a pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you. So just for the next steps, so as you know, we're um, recruiting for interns for fall 2021. And uh, we're also introducing several new uh, projects that might be interested. Uh, to you, uh, in addition to the geospatial land use development that we were working, we were so we were working on. Um, that particular project that we were so we were working on was just one piece of it. So they were working on the general plan. We have, we still have the existing zoning specific plan. Um, Twenty plus layers. <laughs> so, so, so if you could think about this, you know. If if there were you know if we didn't use the technology of Python and you know all of these great resources that we have here, we wouldn't be able to efficiently produce this giant database for the whole region. Um, so we can talk more about that. I mean, <laughs> the geospatial data is is such a large data, and we spend um, just to give you an idea. To, uh, from the day that we start to the day that we sort of finish it takes about at least a year and a half to do that to 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 work here. Yeah, to to do all of that. Um, so so I I want to maybe use about uh, the next you know um, five ten minutes to talk about this um, the regional data platform that we're working on and how is it connected to. Uh, our 2024 Connect SoCal, which is the long range plan. So, as you know, the Skag region is complex and growing. 
So this project grew out of a recognition that the region is facing unprecedented challenges like the climate change, housing prices, transportation, and growing equity. And that addressing these challenges must happen from the ground up. That means from local jurisdiction under a common vision to move the region forward. So addressing these challenges require more coordinated planning, engagement, and effective data sharing. The region's success starts with the local planning efforts. This is why um, local jurisdiction general plan have been the biggest focus for the regional data plan. And if, if you're not in the planning world, the general plan means it's a comprehensive plan for each city, and they are required to produce this uh, general plan. And within the general plan, there are several major, there are several mandatory elements. One of them is the housing, open space, circulation, um, conservation, uh, you know, and, and so on. Basically, these components, elements will help to move uh, the, the city in, in the path that they want to grow. So, so this particular regional data platform will basically provide the resources and the tools and the data for local jurisdictions to update their um, general plan. And as you can see here, um, there is a symbiotic relationship. So we have several challenges. So currently at the local level, um, they struggle to update their local general plan. Uh, because they, they have lack of data, tool, resources, support. Uh, at the regional level, consequently, if the city, uh, if cities and counties are not uh, updated, updating their, their long-range plan, it means that we don't have the most up-to-date data. So it will basically um, you know, delay us in our regional planning process because we want the most updated data so we can accurately project the future. So in this regional data platform, um, also known as RDP, there are two major goals that we have uh, for this project. The first one is to facilitate stronger local planning by providing modern tools and best practices to assist with general plan updates. And the second goal is to streamline the process of collecting and integrating data from member agencies to SCAG to enhance regional planning and collaboration. So in this way, the RDP aims to support regionally aware local planning and locally informed regional planning to support more holistic and sustainable planning throughout the region. So now it's gonna get a little bit technical here, but I, want, I just want you to focus on these three colors, um, blue, orange, and green. So the blue is GAG's new and evolving geospatial infrastructure. These are the foundational components that support SCAG and member agencies. It includes um, new regional hub and is powered by RGS Online and the latest release of the RGS Enterprise. In orange are planning tools and engagement tools for member agencies to use for local planning. And these include focused tools for specific workflows. Helper, uh, which is one of them. Helper stands for housing element uh, housing element parcel tool, uh, parcel uh, helper. It's, it's actually, this application was developed um, to help cities and counties to update their housing elements. Um, and out of the box tools like business analysts and RTS Urban that are intended to help with a multitude of common planning and engagement workflow. And the last one is the green color, which is the data orchestration. And to me, this particular uh, component is the uh, core of this regional data platform, which focuses on the uh, data orchestration. And this particular component addresses one of the primary goals of the RDP to facilitate better data sharing between SCAG and member agencies. Um, and the process that uh, we have talked uh, about, we have been talking about is the local data exchange or the local input process where Will and uh, Sophie basically did the manual work to collect that information. We want to automate that process for the whole region. So this particular um, platform will help uh, SCAG and local jurisdictions do so. Um, and um, this is just some of the tools that we are introducing to the region. 
Um, so as I mentioned, there are there are several there are three buckets here. Um, two spatial structure. We have the regional information hub. So imagine if you are a stakeholder or a city staff, you can go on this regional hub and you can find all of the information uh, that we are releasing as GAP from the land use data to transportation data or open source um, or open space and other types of data set. You can find it there. Um, not only that, but you can also log in. If you are a city staff, you can log in and now it will give you additional benefits and additional tools that you can access. One of which is the RGS urban. Or you can also log in and, and open this uh, open the application called the local input web, and now you can click on that parcel and you can change the language on it. And and once you do that, uh, and once you approve that data, will be flown back to SCAG. Before it goes back to SCAG, it's going to go through this um, uh, data quality QA QC thing to make sure that the data that's submitted by local jurisdictions. Uh, are good and accurate to make sure that you know they don't enter any uh, housing units under a commercial cluster, for example. So, so that basically the process will help us to get the data, the increase our data quality. But that data will be updated in the system and will be pushed back to the local jurisdiction so they can use that for their housing for their local planning activities. Um, and then uh, on this hub, you can also request technical assistance. So say if if a city is indeed a um, uh, you know uh, a GIS related project or a spatial analysis something like that or data request they can submit that to us and we can we will have somebody to go out and contact them and provide us assistance and then the planning against planning and engagement tools these are pretty much off the shelf or um, you know developed applications so SoCal Atlas infographic. Helper is basically an application to help uh, cities to update their housing element. Uh, parcel locator is something that we, uh, that local jurisdiction actually requested from us. Um, the parcel locator is actually pretty cool. Um, you can enter an APN and we zoom into that particular parcel. It will pull up all of the information for that parcel, uh, like the size, the, the land use type, Maybe the ownership information or something like that. You know, so we're still working on that. And then general plan update site and general plan feedback survey. So these these two components are pretty much uh, pre-designed for them to quickly create a web page for their housing for their general plan update uh, process process. Because part of the process they require to uh, conduct public hearing. So this particular component will help them to quickly have a website up um, to convey their message and to collect input. Um, so, so that's that. And the uh, data orchestration, like I mentioned earlier, which focuses on the local input web. And within, within that local input web, we have the local input hub, editor, um, data sharing, review and approval. So right now we're focusing, we're working with Esri on this. Um, so right now we're focusing on this component right now, and um, this is going to be huge for us because that's going to help us to collect streamline the data. And you can imagine there's so many um, value added products we can create from this database alone. Um, so Jack mentioned that he's really pouring a lot of effort into this project so he can really implement this throughout. I don't know, this region is the world. So I hope he's, he's going to be doing that. Um, so we presented this project recently at the UC, uh, uh, SRE UC conference uh, in July. And right now we'll, we'll, we'll basically uh, just completed our user testing with pilot jurisdictions. And these are the jurisdictions that we uh, work with. And right now we're in the process of incorporating, analyzing, and uh, validating their feedback, and hopefully, you know, uh, make that make those changes into the system. And finally, in fall 2021, which is coming up, we will uh, launch this uh, system for everybody to use. So there's going to be a public facing of this 
platform, there's going to be a private, uh, a, a login, you know, credential login for uh, cities and counties um, to access to more confidential data. So that's pretty much that. And so that's one of the projects that, you know, if you are interested, we can get work, we can work on this and you can be part of the team um, to work on these different components to help cities to uh, work on the data, to use Python. And so there's so many, um, you know, uh, tools and buckets here that you can, you can be interested in. And that's, with that, um, I would like to uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, have us here, Jim and I, and Sophie and Will, to be here and share share with us, share with you our uh, project and, and the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to help emphasize, you are looking for current interns, right? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. Do we do we have a descript a fresh description of what you might have the interns working on? Uh, we lost Ken. So anything that went to Ken, oh. well, we probably be group with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, we okay. group, but basically, you know, it's going to be ranging from data uh, processing using Python, very detailed work, all the way to application development. So. Um, we, you know, when we develop the scope of work with you, we, we always try to make it, you know, uh, as uh, 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 a variety of different, you know, projects. So, so folks can choose um, from that. What's your expectation from the candidates for the internship? What kind of students are you looking for? Well, you yeah. like to ask questions. Like Will mentioned, you know, don't be shy, ask questions, but of course, you know, have some sort of knowledge about ArcGIS, ArcGIS Pro, or some data processing skill and so on. So, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll also address that. So generally what we do with the internship course, internships that we have partnerships with uh, like SCAG, uh, the scope of work is is provided to us by the, the client. So. The first case, Tom and John, and they'll add the, the new one, the new uh, data possibility of working on this new project. And then what we do is we all we we try and match that and make recommendations. Then at the end of that scope of work, when we advertise the internship, we will recommend what courses you should have already taken based on the skills that they are requesting ahead of time. So if it's um, you know something. Some of our GE courses are preparation enough or the introductory or for more advanced work, we might recommend that you've taken more advanced courses, depending on the project and the scope of work. So it will vary. And we tend to translate their skill set, requested skill set, with our classwork. What I'm also hearing now is that because you have a range of projects or ways to participate in aspects of the project that if someone has had say 301 but not had 383 there might be a project for you or some Correct. definition of a project that is accessible to you having had 301 if you've had 382 and are taking 383 then you might be able to do something that's more technically advanced because they would have had more programming under their belt. So, so I think if you're interested, and that includes the remote audience here, <laughs> so if you're, if you're interested, then, uh, then share your resume. And we, uh, let's see, should we send it to Daron? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> send it to Daron and between Dr. Loyola and Tom and Joan, then we'll be We'll be matchmakers. Yes. And, and we do a, a big call for spring as well. So if you're in the thick of fall already and you're just kind of like, uh, I'd like to do this maybe next semester, yeah. uh, we do a, a, we'll do a large call again soon, uh, soon ish, actually <laughs> for spring to get you ready and set up for spring internships if you would like. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, because the fall semester just started, right? Yeah, well, we're actually decently into it now. That's oh, my, my, my apologies. Sorry. I haven't, I haven't been out of school for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 all it's all going to be a blur. It's still summer weather 
out there, so you're like, we're still in the summer. It's okay. No, that's okay. Well, well, it, and, you know, fall, fall was kind of off to an unusual, I'll say, unusual start. So, uh, but if you, you know, if you're settling in and you think you might have a little space to get your feet wet into something, then I think we can probably still work something out. So you do not have to take it for credit. Okay. Um, although if you have room for and are interested in dorm size units, we do have an internship course. And that would be something that you might start in the spring with the, yes. you know, as you anticipate registration for the upcoming semester. But you do not need to do it for course credit. It is just, it's, a, it's an internship like any other internship. Okay, any, any questions? Anybody have any other thing? That All those students get the call. Yes. So the stu any student that is a part of spatial sciences majors or minors or taking any of our classes, really, because we send out a, a email notice to all of our students, but we also let our faculty know. So you're free to share it within your classes because we have other students that aren't necessarily majors or minors, but are taking our classes. So uh, the faculty are welcome to share the internship announcements as well in the class. We distribute it widely on social media. And it is on our website and also I, I do news we, we yeah. send it out to the can, yeah, all corners look, of the world here you can, you can look at SSI internships and yeah. I there's yeah. information there, there's 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 a web page I do news items so okay I guess I have to call on <laughs> <laughs> so the value proposition for the students here is that you know, you're all very good and capable, but, but at some moment in life, you're going to have to distinguish yourself from everybody else, and you and you need a one-liner. And so a one-liner from listening to today's presentation is when they say, well, we're looking for somebody that's comfortable with big data. And, and your answer would be, well... Been there, done that. Uh, I've only worked with data sets with 5 million features. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would likely be the game. The clincher. When I went for an academic job, my first job, the place I was interviewing at wanted somebody that was comfortable teaching big classes. And I said, well, I can do that. And then at the end of the interview, they asked, well, why do you keep saying you can do it? I said, well, the class I teach right now is 500. So what are you talking about? They were talking about 120. Uh, I had an offer before I got home from the interview site. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, you, you all get hopefully fantastic experiences and classes. And there are other people from other institutions that they might likely interview as well. And so what you're looking for is what, 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 what's the icing on the cake that I can do that will put me at the front of the class, the interview class. Right. I cut you off, sorry. Well, and, and actually I wanted, I want to introduce, in addition to Tom and Junkie and our VIPs, we have Dean Tammy Anderson, this is a CT for experiential learning. And, and maybe she'd like to give a plug for experiential learning. Well, I don't need to. You guys are doing it. <laughs> You're doing it brilliantly. I'm so excited. Um, this is this is what our students need. And just like uh, Professor Wilson was just saying, you know, setting yourself apart. And right now, USC has plenty of 4.0 students coming in here, right? They're brilliant. And uh, I'm an alum. When I was an undergrad, I probably would not have gotten you. <laughs> I mean, these kids are just brilliant. Y'all are great. Um, so you need something to kind of set you apart. And experiential just gives you so much opportunities to, to test out what you're learning in your, in your classes, to test yourself out, to, to see is this something that's a passion for you. We want you to you know, do all of this work and be passionate about it. My father used to say, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> so we want those kinds of experiences for all of you. So I'm just really thrilled. But I also wanted to thank you two because, you know, um, yes, it's a win-win, definitely. But it is a little bit of a, you know, challenge for all of you because you are working every day. And then you have to be responsible for working with our students. And we thank you for everything that you do for our students. So to yeah. that end, in fact, I think it was, maybe it was one of the very last lunches that we were able to have before the COVID shutdown. <laughs> yeah. So it does take a lot of planning 
uh, to be able to set, set these internships up. And something that we started within the Institute, um, and we haven't had very many opportunities to get to do this because it's supposed to be a presentation in person. Um, in, uh, in, in the military and in other organizations, there's something called a challenge point. And it's, there's, there's, a, there's a, I need to where Steve Fleming went <laughs> to, to, to actually explain this, right? But so there, there's, there's something about getting, you know, if you carry the challenge coin and you see them again, and if you don't have the coin on you, then they have to buy you a coin, you know, something like that. But, but, but I think the larger, the larger, like the larger, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have Steve tell you this. So, the, so but the, 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 the acknowledgement is that this, it, it, that we're a team and that, that having, be, having presented, been presented with a challenge point, we acknowledge it as part of, a very important part of our team. And so uh, on behalf of the Spatial Sciences Institute, I think you guys are the, even Joseph Kursky from, from Esri. I think Joseph was our very first challenge coin recipient. So you are in the company of Joseph Kursky here. Oh, <laughs> so you. thank you very much because, oh, because because we couldn't do this without you. Thank and you, you so we, we appreciate the fact that we have the relationship that's going on over semesters. And it's just one that we are uh, hoping we can just keep on going. So thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. wow. All right. So I think we better let everybody go. Yep. Thank you again. Thank you all for joining virtually. Thank you. Thank you. The recording will be available.